This episode is sponsored by Exactuals, perfecting insurance payments and the data driving them. I, I remember you turning up in like jeans and t-shirt or something like completely inappropriate for the weather, I'm sure. Oh, not just the weather, <laughs> usually also for Lloyds, right? There is a certain... <laughs> yeah, exactly. Uh, sort of strict uh, dress code in Lloyds. And I think that in the lab, we just yeah. broke it. Well, luckily the rules actually changed just before the lab opened, a few months before. you. Before that, you had to wear a blazer, sorry, to go into the, the underwriting room. Uh, but they changed the rules. Inga Beale, who was the uh, CEO at the time, changed the rules, I think. So um, we were good. But yeah, I think you're probably the one of the most cash in the building at that point. Oh, I'm sure that there was a point that I was walking around with a T-shirt, maybe. Can't really promise, but that was a very colorful mismatch of colors that was most definitely not a, what people at Lloyd's expect. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. One of the things that I noticed, especially hanging out with uh, the guys from InsureCore and uh, Lair, that mainly InsureCore is that Business is done in the pubs around Lime Street and the city. How true is that? Do you know what? I, I don't really, I, I don't think I can answer that question. Not, okay. not for any political reasons, but just because, I, I mean, what we do in the lab is very different to the core business as usual. And I think the market is tens of thousands of people all in all. And I'm sure, I'm sure there are plenty of people that would just do all the business in the pub. I'm sure that is the case. I can't say it is because I never witnessed it personally. Um, but I'm sure it is. I'm sure it's true. But I know there's a lot that aren't like that as well. So, I mean, if you think of all the thousands of people that are in the Lloyd's, um, Lloyd's market, there's going to be some people that, you know, have completely different work patterns to others. And um, the people we tend to work with in the lab, um, the innovators who work, who work in the lab with us, I don't think many of them were that kind that would spend the day in the pub working. But um, I certainly have heard stories myself as well. I'll say that. Well, yes, I mean, I, I actually live in the city. Um, you live so in the city itself? No kidding. I, yeah, yeah, in the square mile. I live um, uh, probably a 20 minute walk to work. Um, mm -hmm. which I haven't done for quite a while, <laughs> clearly. Um, but yeah, I kind of like being in the city. It's, it's, a, it's a really nice place, surrounded by history. Um, it's a short walk to the river, walk to, to Regent's Park, walk to the West End. It's kind of quite a good place to be um, for, for some reasons, but you don't really get much space. <laughs> so pretty small flat. Um, probably not the best times to be in a small flat in central London in COVID times, but... But, um, but yeah, we're, we're, we're getting through it. By the way, do you play or is that your wife's? So the piano yeah. um, we bought as a lockdown, uh, a lockdown hobby. So mm. I started playing in April and I actually really enjoy it. It's pretty good fun. So uh, I've been learning from scratch and I've I can, I can play a few tunes. I won't, I won't, uh, I won't embarrass myself just now. <laughs> no, 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 that's fine. Yeah, it's oh. good. Oh. Listen, this is something that I picked up. It's a ukulele. At a certain point, I was like, yeah, that's that's big enough uh, oh, for me to go like this. But that's uh... <laughs> We can do a duet. <laughs> I don't think so. Uh, the best I could do is uh, a C chord, right? Um, now, because you were talking about the size of the apartment, I was like, oh, is that an apartment? What is that? Is that a piano? It's a piano, yeah. yeah. <laughs> so it's obviously not that small, but it's 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 not exactly luxurious. So. Yeah, it's yeah. It reminds me the the size of I used to live in New York, and then we had like those super super small apartments, and like whatever you can, you know, it's all about how can I optimize the storage. Yeah. 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 I mean, I've seen some small apartments in places like um, Paris, and like compared to that, like. Those things like shoe boxes. This is pretty small, but it's not that painfully small, thankfully. Uh, well, you have a piano, not a grand piano, but it's a piano, which is already yeah. two steps. And I'm sure that the neighbors are happy. Yeah, well, but... it's, it's got it's electric, so I've got oh, I've got yeah, and brilliant. so then my wife doesn't have to put up with me either. So it's all good. Uh, that's great. 
Uh, so the city, the city has a great vibe. So everyone, uh, for people who don't really understand, so from time to time we need, you know, to, to uh, let's call it a quick explanation. The city, it's a kilometer by kilometer since the Roman Empire when they were over there. And all the insurance of the world is basically there. <laughs> basically. Well, no, so, so in L the city of London, it's got kind of it's got a lot of banks and insurance, um, a lot of banks and legal for law firms and things, mm -hmm. particularly around like the law courts. Um, but then the east end of the city um, of the of the square mile, EC three is the postcode. That is just insurance. Like every building basically has got some something to do with insurance. So yeah, it's it's kind of the place to be. You can walk from the Lloyd's building to um, any one of a, a dozens of, uh, of insurers or brokers um, within within like five minutes. So yeah, that is the heart of insurance. Um, I'd say heart of insurance in London and one of the hearts of insurance in the world, clearly. Most of, I don't think that most people understand Lloyd's. What does it mean? And I'm not going back 300 years ago to Lloyd's uh, coffee shop. How does it work today with the syndicates and the brokers? Sure. So um, Lloyd's of London is actually an insurance marketplace. So Lloyd's is not an insurance company, um, but it's it's kind of a, a special thing to, to say Lloyd's is a company or whatever is 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 kind of difficult because it was it's not a limited liability company or a public limited company. It's it's it was found it was created. By an act of parliament so it's kind of a specific law that makes lloyds exist um but it's a marketplace and it has a lot of um, services that it pro provides to the insurers within the marketplace and that includes the ability to write in different countries around the world um, the way it works with the syndicates it can be very confusing to people um, but what what happens is is a bunch of people with money that want to invest it will come together and create a syndicate. And so they put all their money in a pot and say, okay, we want to get some investment return on our money. So we'll create a syndicate. That syndicate will be like syndicate 1738 or something. And it's always they'll create them. that syndicate. And, it, and their aim with that syndicate will be to ensure, for example, marine hull risks. So then what they need to do is they need to get in, they need to get someone to actually run that syndicate for them. So then they'll get what we call a managing agent, an insurer. So, you know, for example, Hiscox or, or, um, Beasley. or Beasley or AXA yeah. or whoever. So that managing agent then runs the business on behalf of the syndicate beneath it. And so the people who put the money into the syndicate, they can put their money into multiple syndicates if they want. Mm -hmm. And the, the organization that runs it on their behalf, the Hiscox or whoever it might be, they could run multiple different syndicates as well. So it's kind of a many to many relationship in a way, but let's just take one example of a syndicate. We've got all these people putting money in and we've got a company running it on their behalf. We have about 55, 54, 55 of those managing agents running syndicates at Lloyd's. And each one of those could specialize in a certain thing, like I say, marine cargo or, um, or maybe property or whatever it might be. They all have their specialisms and they will typically have a box in the Lloyd's building. And a box is basically just a place to sit, but they call it a box. And um, the underwriters will sit in that box and they will, they will sit there during the working day, um, not anymore, they sit at their de desk at home, but let's go back to the room. They're sat in their box and a broker will walk in with a binder full of information and a load of kind of details on a risk that they want to ensure. They'll have a conversation with the underwriter. Perhaps they'll do a deal, perhaps they won't. And then the broker will then go walk to another box, walk to another box, walk to another box until they've, until they've covered all the risks they need to cover. Um, but yeah, what, what happens is that those boxes will be for different managing agents and um, and they are basically the insurers in Lloyd's Market. Now, the, although there might be, I don't know how many managing agents all doing marine hull risks, they're kind of in competition with each other, but they're also collaborating with each other. So a broker might come in and he might have 100 million of risk that he wants to, wants to insure, and he might go to the first underwriter, and that first underwriter might cover the first 20 million. 
but then they've still got 80 million they need to cover. So they'll go to, they'll keep on going to syndicates until they've got the risk fully covered. And what happens often is, is some syndicates will follow only. So they'll only, they won't actually be the first to, to underwrite a risk. They'll only follow if they know that somebody decent has, a decent underwriter has started it and they'll follow on. Um, and what you find now is, is companies like Key um, from Brit, which is the first automated uh, insurer, they are follow only. So they will follow the lead of various other insurers in the market and they will provide capacity and provide terms of insurance and all that, all based on somebody who's who's been a leader. So um, it's, <laughs> I think it's getting confusing already, but basically you've got people who provide capital um, and that's the capital with which the insurer runs. That's the syndicate. Then the managing agents run that syndicate and then brokers will come in and do business with those managing agents and those managing agents work competitively, but also collaboratively with, with each other in that market. Let me ask you that. So back in the day, there was, I don't know if it was an anecdote or just an urban legend that when they tried to do the first sort of digital transformation, I, I forgot the name of that project, but basically they gave iPads to the brokers. So instead of them running around with the binders, they will just have everything there. So if God forbids you lose a binder, you need to redo everything from the start. And it caused such a, a tom, a tom or, uh, I cannot pronounce it, uh, an uproar in a sense, that at the end of that day, they basically stuck the iPads outside of a pub and left it there. Again. I heard the same story. <laughs> yeah, it's a, again, it's a story. It's a funny story. Yeah. But <laughs> I, I, <laughs> from before I joined, but I, I heard that. I, I don't know how true it is. Um, I think... I can imagine if you've got a binder full of information, it's going to be, it's probably been collected over a long period of time. It's probably lots of different formats. It's things that some somebody's given you, something you've printed off yourself. It's got your handwritten notes on it. And if you go from that to be given an iPad um, and you don't have a, you know, if it was a, not an iPad Pro, you didn't have a pencil, you wouldn't be able to write on it, you know? So it's kind of read only. So I can imagine it goes from being something quite useful, which you can actually hand to somebody and you can you can talk around, you can write on through to something which is just read only device, which you then have to sync and you've got no internet or whatever. I can imagine it could be a bit of a barrier for some brokers. So I think that's the example of like really good technology, but just not implemented very well, probably. I think there's there's probably a lot better ways of doing that. And I think the take up will probably be a lot better if it wasn't just thrown upon them, if that's what happened. Well, again, it's, uh, I think it's, a, I don't know if it's just a story or a legend or whatever that may be. It's again, it's a story that I've been told when, <laughs> when I joined. So if it's pre your time, most definitely it's pre my time. And it's just, it's funny in a sense. I, I, I think, I think there's something cool about the tradition of Lloyd's and I think it's something that draws people to Lloyd's, but then I, I think we can also use technology and make, make everything better without ruining the tradition, you know? It's just, I think it's just about making the best use of technology to kind of, for example, make a cyber underwriter, you know, not not a, an underwriter who does cyber, but kind of like make an under, underwriter kind of fully equipped to do everything he can or she can from their desk immediately with all the best information to understand the risk and all the, you know, having the ability to do video calls as well as see somebody straight away next to them. The ability to kind of understand the risk fully but still have the valid, valuable conversation with the broker. Because I, I I like the tradition of people coming into the building and talking to each other about complex risks where they need to build, they need they build relationships and they kind of they they, they build trust. And um and I, I think that kind of stuff works really well in the Lloyd's Lloyd's building. Um I don't think it means you can't have technology and innovation. I think you can have both. Um I think the tradition of having to wear a tie is, is maybe not so required, but um, but the you know other traditions that we have in Lloyd's, I think I kind of like them, and I like the the added dimension it brings to, to work. You go into work at Lloyd's knowing the history, you know, and kind of you go there seeing stuff and seeing how things have been done, done in the past, and and I think you know it's it's just cool going to going to work in a, in a place where you know it was involved in ensuring the Titanic, you know, and you know that um, you've seen pictures of 
how people were operating a hundred years ago. And like, sometimes you wince at the fact that it's actually quite similar now, but then you also think, well, actually the interaction between people is really valuable. And uh, what I'd like to see is in like five years time, still having those face-to-face -face conversations, but the, the underwriters and the brokers having such technology at their hands that they, they're using those conversations to deal with really important points and relationship points and, you know, parts of, parts of um, discussion and negotiation that I think wouldn't necessarily be quite as effective virtually or remotely or on email and things like that. How do you guys at the lab pushing that forward? So um, I think it's bit by bit the lab is doing it. You know, you, you don't come to the lab to, uh, you don't expect the Lloyd's lab to like completely be a game changer for the whole of the market. It's just, it's just not going to happen. I don't think any of the startups we've had in would be, you, you couldn't really say that they are um, um, disrupting insurance, really, I, I don't think. I think we're just bit by bit bringing bits in. We, we're, we're trying to change the bit of the culture you know, get people more accepting, more willing, more keen to take on innovation. We're proving that, you know, insurtechs can add a lot of value. And we're doing that through in lots of different areas. So, you know, for example, we've had startups creating a lot of um, parametric products like Parametrics in 2020 launched a new product for cloud downtime. And then in December, if you remember, Google Cloud fell over spectacularly, um, exactly the kind of thing that Parametrics was set up to, to, to ensure. Um, so that's a very new, very new type of insurance product that was, that was created in the lab um, with a great startup. Then we've got other companies like, for example, Scylla Space, who are using um, satellite imagery, not for like looking at how things look, but actually measuring subsidence of land to a resolution of one millimeter. Like, and if you can see movements of one millimeter with refreshes every week, you start to see trends as to what's going on with infrastructure. And we were looking at dams and seeing how dams might be more likely to collapse um, based on what their movement has been over the last several years. Um, other examples of things is, is using um, optolytics. I've done a deal with Lloyd's, Lloyd's, um, Lloyd's of London, not just the insurance market, but with Lloyd's of London. And they've got an AI solution and they help kind of deal with spreadsheet complexity and put models on the cloud so that people in, the, in, in Lloyd's and in the managing agents that are working with us, they can share the model in a governed way they can bring different data sources in and use them and in, in, in various things. And these are all kind of, a lot of things we're doing are brand new bits of tech. Some are, you know, tech that's been around for a while, but we're just using it in a slightly different way. But doing things that haven't been done in the market before and getting people to try that and see, actually, this is this works, this is really good. Um, and that kind of, I think, bit by bit, gives them confidence to try more, try more new things. And over time, I think we'll see the Lloyd's market taking on more and more and more tech and, um, and getting to that point, I hope, where we have that bionic underwriter. Now, I, it's very interesting because there are many challenges, especially when we're referring to the tradition earlier and then moving forward. Um, and especially the breadth of the different technologies that you can provide. Because at the end of the day, my understanding is that it's providing technology to the market and then it's up to the market members to pick okay that makes sense for us are you looking at that as an you know added value to the service that you're providing and just telling the members here's something that can be helpful for you and they need to be active or is there some sort of a pull push yeah. mechanism so i mean the lloyd's lab is a service to the lloyd's market so that's 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 true. That's definitely what we are. We're a service Lloyd's market, and it's up to the Lloyd's market to to get value from it. So you know, the more you're engaged as a managing agent, the more you'll get from it. And so we do rely on the market being engaged and and being mentoring the teams and bringing value like that. And we we like we think we're giving value back to to them as well. So they're getting they're putting some time in, but getting a lot out of it. And we've seen that because we've seen quite a few commercial deals being done with teams that met and worked together in the lab. Yeah, we're making it. Oh, 
Yeah, I was about to say, you know, you, you mentioned mentors. So I need to give a, a shout out to uh, Tim Lee and uh, Andy Stevenson that were my mentors. One uh, team, Teams was with uh, Beasley, uh, Bigsley back in the day. And I think that Andy was with Hiscox. So that was, and it's a very, actually the, how to get the members of the market as mentors is super important, especially for the startups who are part of the cohort. Now, are you, by the way, are you considering yourself as an accelerator or a lab? What will be the, I don't know, the definition there? You know what? I don't really know or care. Yeah, that's good. That's good. <laughs> it's like, I know people, can't, I'm sure somebody will have a definition of whether it's an incubator, an accelerator or, or, or whatever. But I think, um, I think as long as the people know what they're getting, I don't really mind what label we put on it. Um, that, but I think, I think it's probably an accelerator nice. just because, um, you know, I think that's the feedback we've got from people is that when they, they come to the lab, the amount of feedback they've got and the speed they've got it, it's really helped them take their business forward. Um, and yeah, you call out to the mentors is absolutely right. The, the mentors are the most valuable thing in the Lloyd's lab, I think. Um, they've been awesome. And we've, we've had well over 100 different mentors so far. Um, in the last few cohorts, we've had about 60 in, in the cohort. And, and they've been great. So cohort six is going to run in spring, summer this year and um, applications. Oh, that's cool. That's when it runs. Yeah. Applications close on 22nd of Feb. Okay. So we make sure that we promote it once more. Now, how was the shift from in person in the lab to do everything virtual? That wasn't actually difficult as as we thought it might be because you know we created a, a space in the Lloyd's building for for innovation yeah but what we found was moving online was actually quite smooth um there were pros and cons so the pros were that the mentors um i mean the mentors turn up on time almost every time anyway that it, it you know that there, there are some there is a bit of dropout because oh you know running late or, or I can't get to the Lloyd's building to come in um, and stuff like that. As soon as you move it online, there's no, there's no walking from the office to the Lloyd's building, even if it's only five minutes away, there's no walking. So you kind of find that there's, that it's really easy for people to turn up on time. So we actually found that the meetings happened really well because everyone was just going from Zoom meeting to Zoom meeting to Zoom meeting in, in, eight, in May, June, July this year, uh, last year. So that kind of worked quite well. Um, so the meetings, the mental meetings were really good and the engagement between the teams and their mentors was really good. Didn't matter where you were or anything like that. It all kind of it all went well. The thing that we missed though was because we had this lab space, we used to get a lot of people just walking in and um, brokers, underwriters, um, people from regulators and various places around the world would just turn up and we'd have teams in the lab. And I would, part of my job, which I used to really enjoy was I'd see someone walk in and kind of just look, looking curious and I'd go and say hello, find out who they were and I'd find I'd find some sort of link to a startup that we've got in the lab or we've had in the lab and I'll make a connection. And I used to really enjoy that. And that obviously just stopped. Um, we used to do lunch and learns and we turn those into a spotlight series, but lunch and learns, we literally have lunch on and there'd be a, a lot of people coming and networking at the, at the end of the sessions and before the sessions. Um, the startups would be based together in the lab. And I don't know if you've seen, but Hyper, Hyper Exponential, HX, they've kind of set up a community and they've got um, various other insure techs on that, I think includes uh, insure data, Inari, and maybe some others. And that's because they were based together in the lab and they were talking and they were working together and realizing their solutions could work together. COVID meant we had to go online and actually it worked much better than I would have expected. We found that mental meetings were really effective because everyone turned up on time because everyone was just going from Zoom meeting to Zoom meeting. So it actually meant that the mental meetings worked really well and the quality of connection was really good. Um, so that was fantastic. But what we missed was the, um, the random interactions we get in the, in the lab space, the physical lab space. 
There is a beautiful serendipity in there, you know, even when you just step out from the in the lab, of course, because people are coming into the lab. By the way, are still people going through the lab or well, pre-COVID uh, to use the espresso iPad machine? Yeah, that's the coffee machine. Thing. Well, luckily now there's some more coffee machines in the, in, in the building that are pretty decent. So uh, it's not such a hot spot anymore. Well, I think that that was the the brilliance of it. It's like it was the first you had people from all all Lloyds learning that you can get free espresso or, or flat white or whatever and you can adjust it and and it's all presented on this beautiful iPad and you go and tweak it and then you know it's free. However, and there was a point that we tried to put like okay, every time you take a coffee, it's free. Just put your business card so we know who you are and later on we can actually contact you. Yeah. And it was, yeah, it, well, you know, there, there is a pros and cons for everything. First, yeah, we need to buy yeah. everyone coffee every day. The, <laughs> and the second is like, yeah, great networking. Now you know where the lab is. It's fantastic. Yeah. So and that, that was good. And, um, you know, having several startups in the lab together at the same time, I mean, lots of good things happened. I mean, the hyper exponential creating a community with an RE and others was, was one thing that was really good, but also a lot of startups, um, you know, they just help, they just gave each other advice and things in the lab. And, with, you know, when we're sharing ideas, I thought it was great. Um, it was such a shame that we've lost that over the last year, but um, I'm sure it'll come back in 2021. So I think that the, the, the best, I don't know, not advice, but actually about candies to Andrew and Philip, uh, the little guys, about their kids' candies. So I introduced them to Maltesers, Flake, which is my childhood favorite, maybe with the exception of uh, Cadbury's uh, uh, nut, uh, nut and Fruit, and of course Maltese, Maltesers, which are like the better M&Ms, because they have a little bit flavor with the color. It's Wait, wait, wait a second. You don't have Maltesers in the US? No, no, no. There is something different, but it's not the same. And it's, you know, Later on, when you introduce it to someone, I'm, I'm preaching to the to the choir here. Come on, the, the 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 question will be: Do you just let it melt, or you eat it immediately? Or actually, a question for you: How do you eat Maltesers? Well, what you do is you you have, put your head back and you put it on your lips, and then you blow it up in the air, and then you stop blowing and catch it in your mouth. No shit, that's yeah, a new one. For that's me. the way you eat Maltesers. Yeah, okay, yeah. yeah, listen, I'm I'm this foreigner who used to get them in red bags and go like, oh my God, I need to eat them before my brother eats them. And I used to take my time and run away from because otherwise he will just nom, 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 nom. <laughs> But again, I'm in my 40s now, so <laughs> that, that was a I would like to say a while ago, it still is. Um, so what are we expecting for cohort six? So for cohort six, um, we're going to have probably again a remote program, which is fine. We might be able to go um, have some face-to-face -face meetings if things work well, but for now, let's assume all virtual. And as usual, we've got four themes. So this time, the four themes, one of them is um, data and models, which is a thing we've always had, basically new sources of data new ways of modeling data. We love that kind of stuff. We always have that. Second one is geopolitics. So that's a new one and that's going to be tricky. So we're looking for great geopolitics solutions, things that will be relevant to Lloyd's, um, Lloyd's market. Climate change, decarbonization. So that's massive on the agenda. It was going to be a theme last year, but COVID came in. So um, it's a theme this year for us. Um, so we're looking a lot at. And then finally is claims. So we're working with the Future at Lloyd's claims team. And um, yeah, we're looking for solutions that can help us with that. So what's the geopolitics? What does it, what does it mean? So geopolitics could be anything like um, helping to understand the risk of, you know, whether it's um, political risks in a country, certain countries that are perhaps making it difficult in a region to transport goods or um, or maybe for people to travel for business. Maybe um, we, we could include kind of 
local local challenges due to um, I mean local challenges due to climate and politics coming together kind of could, could create certain issues. We're looking at things that could be maybe create new insurance products or even things that can help inform underwriters to help them evaluate risk or even help um, claims teams validate or, or foresee risk um, claims coming and help kind of maybe pay them much faster or, or maybe help in other ways, maybe help people who are going to encounter challenges, help them to get around them before they, before they actually cause an impact. Um, so I think it could hit in a few ways, but yeah, I'd say political instability in certain regions is, is going to be, it's going to be interesting. So tell me, beside the piano, what else have you been doing? What else have you been doing during lockdown? Ah, so lockdown, no gym. So I've been working out at home, basically what's trying to your, get every day. Thing? What's my thing? Um, so I haven't got much in the way of weights at home. And um, so I've been doing lots of pull-ups, press-ups. And my wife's got a five-foot Olympic bar with 35 kilos. So basically I've got to the point now where I do super, super, super slow squats until it burns so much that I squeal like a baby. Um, so, so my legs feel like they're on fire. Um, so yeah, basically just doing, mo other than that, basically body weight stuff. So I'm getting pretty good at pull-ups now. <laughs> basically right. doing a back workout I can do. I get Nigel Wash. Um... Uh, tweets and all the things that he's doing every day with the I think that he became a salesperson for Peloton but I think he is yeah things yeah, on the payroll good chance it's like between uh, Kobe Bandelak from InsurTech Israel that is selling uh, those uh, Polaris uh, field uh, small jeeps and to this guy it's like we all have apparently we all hustle um, yeah it's good I've been just because I cannot practice my karate or yeah, I, from time to time I pick up a, a class of yoga. Or you pick up what's that, yoga? Yeah, yeah. Uh, I'm, very, I'm very limber. I can, it's, it's good for you, yoga. It is. And, I'm, as, I'm as flexible as the tin man, uh, unfortunately though, so I'm not really good at yoga. I do try it every now and then. But no, I've been doing a bit of, bit of working out and then piano and Netflix, clearly. And um, and a bit of reading too. Yeah. Anything interesting that you read recently, or not recently? Um, I tell you what, the best book I read during lockdown one um, was I'm trying to see it on the shelf. It was uh, Endurance. Endurance. Okay. So it's it's basically about um, Ernest Shackleton going to the South Pole, and so they had this mission to cross the South Pole and um, back about 100 years ago, um, 120 years ago, maybe something like that. Oh, it's actually during World War One this happened. And basically, it was doomed from the day it started. <laughs> and the, they were, it, like, it was the worst ice, sea ice in, in the Antarctic um, uh, region that, for, for a long time. And they didn't even get close to getting on land. Um, but it's like their determination. I think they were down there for maybe a year and a half or more and a lot of that time they were just constantly cold and living on the edge of existence and the if you don't know the story reading the book is it's just you just realize what people can do like when they set their mind to it and how they got out of that was just incredible it was just it was really inspiring and it was just it was just in, it was just I was reading it and thinking, how did they, how did they survive this? How did they get through this? Um, so endurance, I think, was in terms of resilience, um, fantastic book. Yeah, I can add a recommendation, especially with the turmoil, the democratic turmoil that we see nowadays. It's a mindfuck. Um, the plot. It's basically the story of Cambridge Analytica. I think right. the, the title there is um, the plot to destroy uh, America or to destroy democracy, something like that. Needless to say that I, I listen most of the books. I don't read them. I listen to them as an audiobook. So I've, I think that I go through more than one book a week. 
So, and especially, I love the fact that in this podcast, every time I ask someone for a recommendation, and at least two or three weeks down the road, I have the opportunity to listen to it. So I have, I have my cue. Yeah, Ed, it's been a pleasure having you on the podcast. So much fun. Good to chat. I hope there's, um, there's, when you edit it, hopefully there's um, good enough content. <laughs> oh, most definitely there will be. So again, dude, thank you very much for joining me today. Good it's been a pleasure. Good to see you. Good to see you.